and, and those lenders are selling the assets to the special purpose vehicle using traditional ways. Over time, we could extend the tokenization to the full transaction, but basically, um, that's a, a very important design question when you're, you're, you're creating your products. How far do you need to go with tokenization? And can you bridge track phi with, with, with DeFi, if we can, if we can use those high-level uh, terms? Matthew, have you, uh, have you um, have some, some comments on this? Or you have other use cases where sometimes the full transaction has to be tokenized, sometimes only one segment has to be? Well, I, I think you said it the best, right? Like you're you're bringing the value on chain. It's not about what kind of happens after that. I mean, you're gonna once you bring that value on chain and you connect the traditional space to the digital space, you will see new entrants come into the ecosystem to capture that value, right? And this is what spurs innovation. It's, it's what we're calling our zero to one, right? We need to bring the value on chain, and that is what Trade Tech has done. I mean, they are, you know, the guys that. They are the pros in this trade finance space to find that value, bring that real value to the digital world, and then after that, that's that's coming now. Yeah. yeah, and I think everyone here in this room will be uh, experienced in crypto. I think what we all have observed for too many times is that either um, the applications out there are a bit like a hammer looking for a nail. It's just you have this technology and now I have to use it and I really have to use it. But in the end, it's like trying to force sort of a, a, a square peg into a round hole it does not necessarily make sense. Um, and if you combine that then with uh, unrealistic yield expectations and promises uh, not been held, then there's no surprise that there might be sort of a bit of a question mark around the whole industry and what we're trying to do here. Moving away from this, there is a narrative, and we're shaping this together with XTC, where you can use this technology not only in a way that makes sense, but also in a way to create good. Um, in a way that makes sense because, as Andre says, you do not have to force the whole transaction on the chain because make no mistake, most people are still getting paid in, in, in fiat. There are very few people in this world who, who get paid in, uh, in, in crypto and then can go to the grocery store and, and pay in crypto. The, the grocery store wants dollars or, or euros or whatever it is. And doing good is because trade finance, again, touches everything you see, almost every good, and because of the majority of the businesses who produce these goods are small to medium-sized businesses, they're really the local communities. So if you extend additional funding to these businesses, if you help them grow, you also help the local communities flourish. So there is a very strong narrative that actually using this, trans, uh, this, this technology helps the real economy helps real pe people and helps real real um, communities to grow, to flourish, and to develop. Thank you indeed. Uh, SMEs are uh, often individuals uh, in some countries running their own uh, shops, businesses, and it's important to support them, in particular as the, the, the banks have had to de-risk for AML reasons, for regulatory pressure, uh, so everyone is focusing on their core segments. New, new lenders are coming in to fund the SMEs and, and the top banks are usually focusing on the top uh, corporates uh, and making sure they get all the, the, the bells and whistles that those large corporates expect. So it's all about client co-focus on, on, on your, your target uh, clients. But that's good because the new lenders uh, that, um, are, are, uh, that we see popping up, in particular in the UK, and here in the UAE, uh, they are very open to new technologies in, in contract to, the, to those top banks who have a, a long process to, to uh, get regulatory approval to use new technologies. And that's where, basically, with new technologies, we enable EV to do new things, as XTC does with Straight Tech, and we enable new entrants to fund those SMEs. So it's all about, uh, indeed, those alternative lenders. Uh, and I'm sure what we're seeing in the UK and, and the Middle East we're going to see uh, more and more of continental Europe uh, growing so that um, the, the SMEs get the, the funding, but not necessarily from their main bank. 
uh, uh, but of course the main bank will, will continue to be there to, to run the payments, the, the cash management, but the lending will come from specialized uh, players. And that's, that's what also from a commercialization point of view, it's important to position new capabilities for new players. Because changing what is working pretty well is, is very hard. So they convincing someone, like a large bank, to change uh, what they have been doing for you for, for decades, if not centuries, to, to change that from a tech point of view would be decades, of course, and to change that to a new technology without major uh, regulatory uh, requirement uh, will not work. So, so we are focusing really on helping those SMEs get funding from new lenders, and I found this region particularly exciting for, for that purpose. Uh, we are uh, definitely uh, on the existing and trade tech side focusing on, on those new, new players. Any, any question? We, you will get the opportunity to, to raise more questions to, to Matthew and Nils uh, later today. But, but if, if you have one burning, feel free. Sal? Um, where do you guys think the greater opportunity is in attracting crypto users to these yield generating opportunities? Or You've mentioned quite a bit about the resistance that the banks have to budge on the, the new technology front. Um, is there greater opportunity in bringing the banks to the new technology? Yeah, I think it's a it's sort of a twofold. Um, thinking about investment, it makes most sense. I think at this point to to look where where is the wealth in crypto and where large stablecoin holders or people who have exposure there and do not necessarily want to leave that environment. Uh, want to stay in crypto but yet want to get access and exposure to real world assets um, that are denominated in fiat. And uh, just as a side note to that, that's also very attractive because of course stable coins are by nature stable, but then are they, question mark, um, hopefully they are, but there's always a risk of depegging, even if it's just temporary, um, there's always a risk of that. If you have all your exposure in, in that stable coin, you're basically out of pocket in a depeg event. If your exposure is in fiat, uh, once the instruments become due, you get repaid in fiat, um, and that that fiat gets converted in the stable coin, you get repaid in your stable coin, so you'll get more of the stable coin because the stable coin is worth less now. So you're effectively hedged against the DPEG risk. So you can create a hedged situation here while never leaving the crypto environment. So I think that it should be a very attractive feature as well. Last question, thank you, Niels. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, so I've actually, some time ago, um, been involved in a trade finance uh, project. Back then it was um, still permission blockchains. And um, well, the, the project went pretty well, and it was a proof of concept, right? I think it reduced the compliance steps at banks from 80 to 35 back. Uh, huge efficiency increase instead of weeks of approval for um, lending out the money to buy the goods. It would be reduced to one or two days. And somehow it was shelved because um, <laughs> the statement was, how do we get first mover advantage out of this compared to the other banks? And that, that seemed to be the thing they most cared about. So how do you get around that problem? The financing, right, was the issue. There wasn't, there wasn't value on it. We probably had the whole thing built, but where is that actually money that's going to be lent? Like all we've seen in, in these markets so far is over collateralized loans, right? I got that three times the amount of the loan to get a loan. Like that's not realistic. What trade tech is doing through Securitize and on XDC is bringing value onto the chain. And when I say value, it means <clears throat> appreciation of an off-chain asset that just gets brought into the network as a single-sided staking or single-sided yield. That's gone away, right? Like you haven't really heard single-sided staking in a while because it doesn't work. You're giving away tokens. But if you can bring in profit or appreciation from the off-chain space into the on-chain space, that is going to end up becoming a pool of capital that becomes recirculated and becomes where you can start to see under collateralized loan obligations or you can see mortgages. Right? We have to get the actual money in the capital into the networks before you can have first mover advantage, in my opinion. 
Yeah, um, and uh, I think it goes back a bit to what, what Andre said earlier that he's uh, uh, dealing in or dealing with uh, resistance to change a lot. A lot of the banks have done these proof of concepts and trade finance, and I think the issue there is that, again, it's sort of the, the hammer looking for the nail. All I can gather from what you described seems to be a rather limited um, way of dealing with certain problems, compliance, onboarding, but it's sort of a very niche area on the one hand, and the other hand, if you do not have a lot of player accept, players accepting this, um, coming on the same technology, and really going deep, it's never going to work. Because, again, trade is real, trade is in fiat, trade is in paper, trade is messy. Um, it's practices that are hundreds of years old um, sometimes. So how do you harmonize that? And of course, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, players who try to do this. It's very, very difficult. We are not trying to change any of this. What we're doing is we're getting more funding into the system. We're allowing people who have um, large exposures in, in stable coins who have uh, an interest in earning real yield uh, and putting these stable coins to, to work in a sustainable way to earn these yields. And, and that's a fundamentally different approach. We do not want to change any trade practices. That's not, not none of our concern. But um, we want to do the same thing that we have done very successfully in the real, real world by issuing billions of, uh, of, of notes to, to um, sophisticated institutional investors and do this in the crypto space. And there's a real opportunity to do this and to do it now. Basically, you use a carrot to lure them in. Well, it's not so much a carrot, I would say. I mean, if I think of carrots, I think of sticks. <laughs> and they're usually connected. I would say it's... it's where can you go, yeah, it's dollars, and where can you go and earn real yields uh, in an asset class that has, um, I think, historically two basis point loss given default, where you can even sometimes or oftentimes, not only sometimes, oftentimes ensure the exposure with a credit insurer like an Allianz and uh, create further security um, and, uh, and uh, protection for the investor. Where can you earn these outsized yields? And, Trade finance is very specific because it's again, it's although it's huge, it's as an investment still niche in a certain sense. It's not widely understood, and that's where the opportunity is. There's a real arbitrage opportunity, and uh, that's what we want to capture together with the XCC. Thank you, Niels. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Matthew. Always a pleasure as well. And uh, over to you uh, again. If you have more questions, Niels and Matthew will be back on stage. Um, in a few uh, uh, later this afternoon, but uh, in the meantime, I will we'll proceed with more ecosystem partners of XDC Network uh, coming and presenting their offerings. Sarwa, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. In the SLA group, and and we, I'm thinking we will all for the SLA. Uh, it's like a business name, the dog APAC, and uh, the Chihiro, Chihiro Kato, is the CFO. CFO would be a chief strategy officer, I would say. And we also have an anonymous person, Kosuke Machida, and he's uh, responsible for the administration. Kind of it. And uh, she give, uh, he gave her fifty percent for our company. And a little bit it was about our history. And uh, in Japan, the XCC was shown on the May two thousand twenty three last year. And the XCC was listed at the SBI Basic Trade on the, the end of May. And then, you know, XDC is operating very well after, the, after this listing. So the SBI group decided to, you know, building a joint venture with a XDC network. And then we built a joint venture in December 2023. So now we are quite new. Even thinking, what? what Every family shown on the banner, but still not. 
パパも一緒に赤の上赤の上松がいたりそれで Actually here in 2007 2018ビッグイベントでハブフォーザー XDC in Japan. What's it, Subway? What's happened? 2018. You joined. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Correct. I joined 2018 and the XDC network and working for the more than five years. But、uh, I actually went in for the XDC group in 2018 and actually sleeping. 10. 2021. And then、uh, SPA group approached to the XDC,、uh, XDC network and to listing、uh, XDC token. And I was involved in the you know, negotiation with、uh, both SPA and、uh, between the XDC and the、uh, SPA groups. And the other, the other important thing that happened in the February in this year, she joined. And、uh, so, so、uh, a little bit introduce about、uh, our company. And the SBI network is,、uh, you know, joint, as I said, joint venture is、uh, 6% stakes that are held by SBI holdings. SBI holdings is a SBI group's company, the holdings company for the SBI group. And the XDC network is actually a trade of Phoenix stake having a 40% for the stakes. We are headquartered in Tokyo. And、uh, this is a role for the Our company, as you said, you know, expand u s a g e I don't know, the expand of the collaboration for the efficient、uh, the improvement for the trade finance. And then, and the final promotion, the encouragement, the exclusive recognition. So, the, currently, the only a small percentage of people in Japan and also the APAC know the XDC. So, that we try to expand our awareness of the XDC in this region. Well, what, what we're doing for the expansion of the usage of the public chain, XDC network, is that we, we try to make a collaboration and support the company and、uh, which develop the you know, layer to provide for the kind of things for the XDC network. But we currently just started our company, so that we try to find the、uh, you know, right person, the right partner in this region at the moment. Uh, next, uh, next thing s we are going to implement t o i l e finance kind of things.、Uh, we, luckily, we get a、uh, you know, highly talented、uh, real world asset、uh, called Chihiro, and uh, the she, uh, she has a lot of experience in the trading industry. So, the, mainly, she, she gets involved in this kind of things. And,、uh, probably, and uh, she explained、uh, what we are doing on this field later on. And then promotion. And,、uh, uh, no. we, the from last May, we r e focusing just only on the, on the Japanese market. So that we don't, you guys d o e s n t really know the, what we are doing. But、uh, we, and this year, from this year,、uh, we try to expand our you know, activity to the APAC region from Japan. So now we pass to the Chihiro. The Chihiro, Chihiro yeah, explain the detail of our current position. Okay, thank you.、Uh, this is Chihiro, a Chief Strategy Officer、uh, from SBI XDC Network、uh, Impact. And well, I have a little bit about my background.、Uh, I have a background in、uh, trading. Like, I used to do the Like importing thermal coal from Indonesia to Japan, or the other like mineral resource trading、uh, to Japan or exporting from Japan. Thing. So I know the pain point what,、uh, of the trade participants have, like、uh, uh, importer wise or the bank、uh, the people.、Uh, so I'm meeting the、uh, PRC within this uh, using uh, SBI network. Uh, no, I mean, like SBI group、uh, resources. So, as、uh, Tadashi explained,、uh, SBI group is a conglomerate,、uh, like financial conglomerate, and they have、uh, they invested in、uh, 
and uh, uh, blockchain uh, code RSV. So, uh, so within the SBI group, we can arrange the POC and do the POC so quickly. And that's what we are doing uh, at the moment. And as the first uh, POC uh, for the SBI joint venture call, we are now doing this uh, POC uh, with uh, Corda. Uh, APL is uh, uh, providing uh, the bridge with uh, Corda, and uh, we are trying to do the, uh, you know, uh, through the hybrid blockchain uh, solution for us for the one stop service. So uh, we're doing the fiat payment generated by uh, business to business transaction, and but the, all the information. Uh, is securely, you know, uh, transferred from exporter to uh, importer through the code and then FCC network versus by uh, Intel. And uh, we've been doing this POC for the last three months. Then, uh, well, the outcome will be uh, reporting soon, like in a month. So, uh, so yeah, please uh, just uh, wait for that. But um, since we can do this, uh, we can collaborate uh, laboratory uh, with uh, all SBI resources. Uh, we are now calling for the other uh, POC and other things. Uh, so uh, as Tadashi said, uh, we are, uh, so there are many uh, projects going on within the FDC network, but uh, our first collaboration with FDC network, uh, that's uh, with the FCC, FCC credit network uh, for the uh, visualizing the documentation for the trade. And as you might know, the, uh, we are trying with this um, unique technology FCC has, we are trying to digitalize uh, the build landing, the uh, official document uh, for the trade. So, uh, Anyone who has this uh, bill of landing can, you know, uh, change that commodity. That's the tokenization, and then that's like, uh, so we've been using paper for the bill of landing. That's the bill of landing is uh, the way of uh, tokenization of like real world asset, but in a traditional way. But with this uh, blockchain uh, technology, we can trace and then do, you know, hold it. Uh, digitizing the stuff. Uh, on the way, we were built to the Dubai, our oh, luggage got lost, and when we went to, you know, to the airport, <laughs> they said like, okay, well, I think they can lose our luggage. Like it was force majeure, but they said like, uh, we checked your status, but uh, there's no track, and then they're like, oh my, ah, uh, you have to come back to the airport, and like uh, we are coming back and forth. Uh, three times or something. And but with this uh, BL in the form of paper, we, we can't lose, you know, the truck like that. But some bill of paper can worth like billions. So like I was in Toronto business, but and one cargo costs like billions. So if you lose the, you don't want to lose the, you know, <laughs> you and you don't want to lose the truck. So what we are doing is like uh, we have a uh, friend, uh, we have a nice uh, friend in Singapore, the XS network, uh, trade network. So he is calling uh, the all the you know uh, participants use this network. But uh, since it's cross border payment, you know cross border transaction, it is uh, kind of a. Uh, outside Singapore and that's what uh, I, well, we are for and with our network we are bringing all the uh, exporter and importer to the network in that way uh, well, they can start using our you know network chain and at the end they can you know ask uh, for trade finance uh, to the XDC so what well, we need to, you know, bring those actual trade parties that who needs the who needs to be financed. So that's what we are uh, trying to arrange. And so 
uh, there's an opportunity for the liquidity provider to join uh, for the project, or the, if you have the knowledge in the uh, KYC. Uh, because like, oh, we are, like SBI group has a knowledge in KYC and the liquidity provider and stuff, but all the regulation might differ from the country to country. So there's some place that we can, you know, collaborate, and that's something like between XDC trade network in Singapore, and then uh, we in Japan, uh, SBI joint venture is doing. So uh, in terms of NLTR, uh, Japan is soon to adopt that regulation. So oh yeah, so we are doing like ahead of adopting that regulation, we are call uh, arranging this uh, POC and then um, we'll, we'll see uh, how it goes, but like you have to, you know, actually try it and then how it goes with the actual business partners. So yeah, I think yeah. 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 Now is the time for a wake up. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So that's all our presentation. Thank you very much. How was the week last, like the whole last week? Enjoyed? Found it interesting, I think. Right? Enjoying except for the blood. Yeah. But that's part of the game. There's like it's been like whenever there is a crisis, there's always it brings new stories to share for the rest of the life. So I think we all have now several stories to share. We saw this in Dubai. All right, so I'll t get back to this uh, topic of ours. Right, so I'll start with the introduction of uh, our project, which is Invoice Mate. Very recently, three days back, we've been nominated or we've been recognized as Deloitte's Rising Star winner. And of course, we are backed by the leading accelerator programs and the venture builders in the space of uh, crypto and, of course, uh, this region. I'll try to take it forward. It's not working. Let me try this way. Not working. Anyways, I'll use here. I was mentioning about invoices, right? Invoices, by the way, are world's most commonly used commercial documents. We have been having a talk about, okay, let's bring next billion people on chain. Bring them into the crypto ecosystem. Bring them into the Web3. How? Not been happening without bringing them or bringing their utilities on chain. And one of that is instrument of invoice. Every small, medium size, big size, private, public, government, every institution is working with the document name and invoices. And invoices, by the way, are very liquid. They are supposed to sit on, are not supposed to actually, they are sitting on the balance sheet on the asset sides. And the receivable are coming in 60 days, 90 days, means illiquidity. And this illiquidity is in billions. And it's everywhere in the world, regardless of the sector. So what this is causing, it has impact on two segments. One is the business segment itself, especially the SMEs. It is avoiding them to get access to their smoother cash flow. And at the same time, it is impacting the on-chain investor and the conventional investor to get a product or our opportunity to get the stable yields, secure yields. So that's been happening due to the problem of traditional centralized invoicing. Invoicing is happening for centuries now. But unfortunately, it's still living in the past. Time to bring them into the current world, and that's the way forward. We can do it through tokenizing these invoices as RWAs. And with the help of Trip Phoenix, XTC's protocol, that's what we've been doing for the last five months. And of course, in coming slides, I'll be sharing case studies, how we are making it easy for the SMEs to get access to the formal credit how we are enabling the on-chain investor on the trade phoenix getting stable securely yields right let's go for the further details rwa a lot of talk been if you meet five projects of course two or three are targeting that so there's a narrative for the last year or so now we are familiar with blackrock we are familiar with simon fink or uh, sorry larry fink 
and it, it is expected it will be a 16 trillion dollar worth market in 2030 or maybe it will even exceed that on the other side invoice made or oh sorry invoice financing also according to the trade fi finance global it's a bleeding research channel on that side will be say more than 6 million 6 trillion dollar worth market even today it's 3.6 trillion so market has demand market has liquidity what it doesn't have it has been run on a infrastructure been used under use of centuries old centralized systems fraud prone having a problem of the lack of trust so you need infrastructure which again with the collaboration of trade phoenix and in invoice made we've been showing to the world how with the decentralized infrastructure you can create this opportunity this is how it looks like the flow without going into the nitty gritties and the nuts and bolts of the whole flow invoices come on our invoice management system then we do a proper cryptographical encrypted verification with the help also with the iai we then move it to the trade phoenix as a marketplace where already there are on-chain investors and they are getting their yield earned in a more stable quicker non-volatile and safe manner so this cycle has been happening trade phoenix come up with the tokenization they come up with the listing and the pool creation on their platform and providing the opportunity to those who are not having access to the off-chain businesses there are some other players as well for example helping on chain and off chain off, on and off ramping as well in next slide i'll explain it further in fact one slide after this i emphasize on the kyi know your invoice so this is what we do we have blockchain here with the right utility so the whole trail of uh, the invoices from creation to the payment point or financing point goes on chain right here again xtc comes in the bots of ours come in to detect and prevent the frauds and they also help to do quick kyi and do the invoice financing this is the the platform which helps the overall uh, flow of the journey from businesses to the conventional or on chain capital providers so we start with the asset origination we do the kyc of the borrowers and investors i mean together uh, with the uh, trade phoenix gather data credentials documentations everything digitally loan agreement happens on chain and on the platform asset tokenization and management happening on trade phoenix and importantly we have couple of on chain uh, off ramp, on ramp and off ramp otc desks so they help off-chain businesses to get money in fiat because they cannot pay their salaries and bills in stable coins. They have to use it in dirhams and dollars. And similarly, once they are repaying their loans, they have to do it again in the fiat currencies. And then of course, the, those channels come into the play. So that's how we play, we together play as a bridge role. And we are becoming a new frontier for the RWSN. DeFi re re revolution. Now let me come up with the four case studies here, which in last five months we've been um, successfully uh, observing. The first one is the H and H. It was well publicized uh, as our first pilot together, and it was a loan amount of hundred thousand dollars. They of course do a lot of trading work, and for them, extra liquidity or uh, cash flow is very important for them. So already we have done, I think, two tenures and now moving for the third tenure of the two months with them. So the impact that they are growing their UAE operations with a quicker access to the cash flows. Al Sayed group of companies, another UAE based company, started with them about $30,000. I think the tenure started with two months, another revolving as uh, things is happening. The best part is that they are impacting a lot of businesses in Africa and also food sustainability as well. So it's an impact project which we've been helping and they are doing a low procurement uh, like for them and of course bringing value to the, uh, their uh, B2B relationships. Swap, OTC platform again based in Dubai. So they've been having uh, different regions to cover, Turkey, Tanzania and all that. So again, $30,000 was the ticket size we started with them and moving on with the scaling it up. 
So again, for them, it's a SOP, standard operating procedure timeline got reduced with this access to the credit coming from Trade Phoenix through invoice made. Trella, I think probably our best success story. $100,000, the first tenure got finished today and immediate disperse, uh, repayment today. And tomorrow we will be doing the second round with them. So look, you cannot get your second loan in 24 hours or instantly. So this is only possible with this cycle of uh, Trade Phoenix and in, uh, investment we came up with. So a lot of value, It's I just shared four. I think I could have come up with four or five others as well. But this is the real world impact with the real world assets but you need infrastructure for that you need enablers for that and this collaboration between trade phoenix and the invoice mate is exactly what the off-chain world needs to get connected with the on-chain capital providers other overall impact of invoice mate in last eight months we've been live for last eight months is 4.3 million dollar worth processing uh, invoice for uh, finance processing we have done Tokenize over $200 million assets, 1,700 just users, partnerships with institutions, and zero non-performing loans till date. This is the amazing team with me, enabling this uh, ecosystem. I'm going taking it forward. Lastly, we never built it like a unicorn. It always was a camelcon philosophy, which we took from the day one. So that is for the balancing the sustainability part and the go-to market strategy was always towards growth, not towards burn. That's it from my side. We'd love to have more questions from you regarding this collaboration between Trade Phoenix and InvoiceMate bringing the real world impact. Thank you. Your lenders, uh, via Trade Phoenix, I guess, are your lenders taking the, the credit and the fraud risk as well? That's a very good question. Yes, uh, they have to bear, but not the full impact. There is a risk of around 50% for them. But at the same time, we are coming up with a new pool, which will be sort of acting as an insurance pool. So any bad debt happens, that pool will be coming as an insurance. For the bad debts, it will not cover their entire uh, value. If, but of course, when you are in the lending business, it has to be like that. But yes, the dent is not severe, and they, it can be absorbed through the in, a common insurance pool. Or we call it NPL Cover Shield, so non-performing loan cover shield. Yeah. Any further questions? Yep. Yeah. Another very good question. Actually, it all starts from onboarding their invoices because that's the asset which is helping us to originate the loan. So onboarding the asset first, doing the KYI. So that is happening on invoice rate. And then we, once the successful or verified asset has been identified, we put it on a Trade Phoenix. So Trade Phoenix created it into a liquidity, oh sorry, a lending pool. And if it is a bigger ticket size, if it is smaller, they can do it through their own treasury. Otherwise, they will take it to the community. Community will see it as a fractionalized like uh, status. Like if there is a hundred thousand dollars, they will see it in ten pieces or maybe hundred pieces. So uh, not like it's peer to peer financing from uh, our invest investment from their side to the borrowers. So the cycle is like that. So onboarding then KYI, our due diligence, and then reaching to the investors through Trade Phoenix. We can take one more question and then I'll take uh, uh, further questions off the stage. Perfect, so thank you so much for listening. I'm looking forward to see you after the break. Dignesh and uh, uh, I'm being I'm looking after the Comtech Gold project, which is uh, tokenization uh, of gold, which is the first real-world asset tokenization in 
uh, in the UAE or you can say in the region and uh, we have done we have started this project uh, two years back around May 2022 and since then we have actually tokenized 145 kg of coal which is 145,000 and the governance that we have built is around uh, DMCC which is the Dubai uh, government who are helping us to you know get these uh, tokenization done in terms of uh, uh, providing the support through trade flow warrants so more to i'll discuss when we will be discussing on other points so yeah yeah thank you and uh, hello again and uh, you were the first presentation maybe i thought about a few questions i'm very very uh, interested to learn those but um i'm niels um Bailing. i'm uh, the ceo one of the founders of trade tech um we do uh a, uh, a basically tokenization, but also otherwise um, making investable, uh, making trade finance investable. So we, we um, allow investors and uh, originators of trade finance assets to, to connect and transact. We put um, trade finance into capital markets. Oops, I think we need this one as well. Into capital markets. Um, to date, we have issued about 3.7 billion US dollars worth of traditional securities and uh, we're extremely excited to uh, now be working with XTC on also uh, tokenizing assets uh, in this space. And I let Matt do his introduction. Yes, I am Matt, again, uh, director for the XTC Foundation. Uh, handle partnerships, integrations, basically any support for the protocols and businesses building on the chain. If you guys feel free to ask away. Any questions, yeah? Thank you, Ol. So indeed, we're going to continue talking about real-world asset tokenization using the XDC network. We're going beyond trade finance, although uh, you, you have Niels and Matt here uh, focusing on the, the trade finance use case. Um, and the, the first thing I'd like to uh, highlight is what we have launched about uh, five years ago in terms of creating a community uh, of uh, asset, uh, trade finance lenders and investors active in bringing, indeed, uh, in making this asset class more, more liquid. And uh, this is called the TFD Initiative, Trade Finance Distribution Initiative, XDC Network. The foundation are a member of this. Trade Tech is a member of this, founding member even. And basically the, our goal, and um, we have now many proof points, uh, is to demonstrate how an illiquid asset class, such as lending, SME financing, trade finance, is becoming liquid. Why is it becoming liquid? Because it is becoming accessible. And accessible not only for the big boys, the big asset managers, like Goldman Sachs Asset Management we have in the community, but also for family offices and even down to retail investors. So that's the purpose of this uh, initiative that is, has become actually a community which is bringing proof points uh, from lenders, from investors, uh, around the, the, the transformation of this asset class into a liquid asset class. We're targeting many of you, lenders focusing on SMEs, we just heard from InvoiceMate, um, we are targeting family offices, we are targeting funds, those that have the liquidity but are looking for yield with no risk or little risk because trade finance, as Neil said in the previous panel, has a, a very low um, uh, risk um, and, and, and is highly diversified. So if you are active in lending, SME lending, corporate lending, uh, at transaction level, loans, trade finance. Um, if you're a B2B platform, and maybe corporates to, to trade, and, and you want to inject liquidity into transactions like you would inject credit insurance, this is the community to join. There's no business behind the TFD initiative. It's all about demonstrating and attracting more liquidity. Because like InvoiceMate is doing, uh, you, you need to uh, approach the SMEs with new platforms. And, and, and that's definitely, uh, so we need more, more lenders, more, more institutional investors. And we have seen also in the region, uh, indeed family offices setting specific funds 
to uh, 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 focus on this new asset class. Of course, it can be integrated into a fund uh, covering multiple asset classes as well. Uh, so I'd like also to, to focus on this ambition we are all here for, which is all about doing, bringing new technologies to doing new things, not just to replace what is working pretty well. And you're becoming much more attractive as a business if you can demonstrate that the use case you're focusing on is actually really introducing something innovative, not just changing uh, what uh, has been uh, going on for, for, for 50 years. Um, so with this uh, introduction, this is an invitation for you as a lender or as an institutional investor funding emphasis to uh, talk to me about uh, joining the TFD initiative and, 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 and discovering where are the investment opportunities or, or the, uh, the new investors you could be working with. Um, so, um, and this is all about indeed demonstrating that we are expanding the market, making it more attractive, more liquid, um, which is all about the commercialization strategy. So maybe I'll start with uh, Niels um, around the commercialization strategy, the tokenization, which kind of investors are you focusing on in terms of attracting on the new token that you are uh, preparing and, and, and aiming to, to, to launch. Yes, thank you, Andre. And uh, I think uh, one one before I go into this, one thing that stuck with me from the from the previous presentation that I found very very interesting. And thank you for that. Is um, how do you generate value for a network, and how do you get this critical level of adoption? Because of course there is a lot of blockchain projects out there, and as we all know, only a few of them will succeed. So how do you make it succeed? And I think bringing real value to the chain and to the network is what it's about. And by real value in this case, what we're doing is looking at the real economy. And again, it's about this theme that I mentioned previously. This is not a hammer looking for a nail, but this is something that makes sense. You have businesses that need funding, you have investors, and that goes to your question actually, you have investors who have stable coin holdings who want to put these to work in a way that doesn't gamble away the house um, or the holding, and how do you do this? And this is what we're offering with, um, with uh, Yield Tech, uh, as the project is called, and uh, together with XDC, is opening a path for these investors um, to, to access trade finance, which again, historically is one of the safest asset classes. It's also one of the asset classes that many people haven't heard about because the banks have very closely played the cards to their chest. Um, but this is a two basis points loss given default. So if anything should default, there are about two basis points losses. Um, so um, that's, uh, that's, that's, neg that's almost negligible. Um, uh, other asset classes have, have percentage points of losses typically. So this is where we're, where, we're, where we're operating. At this point, we're looking at accredited investors only. So these have investors who uh, fulfill certain minimum criteria set by the SEC. Um, the reason for that is um, regulatory reasons. Uh, we don't want to fall on the wrong side of, uh, of, of the law. We want to make sure that we only deal with people who are sophisticated. The, the rules by and large is you have to have either $300,000 annual income over the last two years or a million worth of assets. If you're married, $300,000 joint income um, is also fine. Uh, but that are sort of the guidelines. So accredited investors who are invest in stable coins will look for a way to lever these stable coins in a, in a way that, that is sensible and that creates a real benefit to the real economy. And that's what the project is about. Thank you. Thank you, Niels. Uh, so indeed, the, the, the technology allows to do much more, but complying with the laws is, is, is essential indeed. Uh, and I guess this is all about uh, what uh, the Securitize is doing when onboarding uh, investors, making sure they comply with the applicable laws as set by the SEC. Okay. Um, so, Yigesh, um, on, on your side, you're, you're um, not uh, focusing on trade finance, but on other real world assets. Uh, gold, tell us, uh, what is this use case all about? 
uh, what kind of uh, uh, investors are you targeting? And uh, did I hear recently that HSBC has been tokenizing gold in Hong Kong? Is that yeah, yes, yes. Uh, true? Yes, yeah, it's true. Uh, so uh, that news is absolutely true, where uh, HSBC has announced in Hong Kong and they are also looking out in London as well to tokenize gold. And uh, when you said trade finance, why not trade finance? Because what's better a uh, stable coin than a gold coin? So we can use over there as well. So coming back to your question is like, uh, what, how, how are we uh, getting into uh, you know, getting more uh, investors and so our target is uh, not only the retail investors but also institutional investors where they want to actually hedge their uh, portfolio because as we all know whenever there is a problem anywhere in the world could be a situational or natural calamities or you could say a war situation the gold is, which has always been, you know, uh, people want to secure as much gold as possible. So, what's better than gold? Uh, in fact, uh, it's like uh, gold is, you know, the starting point, I would say. And there are like other commodities also, which we can, you know, uh, uh, use as, uh, you know, to tokenize it, which uh, we have already done for silver. Now coming back to gold, as I was saying, you know, that's the best thing to hedge over, you know, your portfolio and to cover all your, when whenever the markets are, you know, downside, if you say whether it's a crypto market, it's a conventional market or any other uh, market, if, if, if anybody, if you pick up from, you can say, um, just a new, you know, uh, person going out of the college, Till the person who is 80 year old and anybody is investing into if you ask him what is the asset class that uh, you would be investing into people will start saying we'll uh, youngsters will say nowadays we invest a lot of things in crypto uh, mid-age guys will be using more of the uh, banking stocks and uh, it stocks i would say but in all the range i would say they will always have some bit of gold portfolio in them so that's it. Thank you. I have more questions for you, but I'll be back in a minute. Uh, Matthew, there was a question around private, or a statement even from someone in the audience claiming that private chains have failed. Uh, personally, I wouldn't dare to, to say that, but I don't have the expertise to be that specific. Uh, what is your view? And how does XDC play in this private public debate? For sure. So I think it, it comes down to transparency and decentralization and, and the key principles of this network. So to keep it private is more of the same. Um, and it comes down to accessibility. So just what they're doing at Trade Tech and what we're doing at ComTech Gold, it makes my job easy because essentially we're trying to gain access to these, to this real world, these real world assets, because what it opens up for is new ways to invest. So if I can just put up capital, earn yield like I would in the regular space, I can look at how can I invest in projects building within the digital space. So if I want to be a VC, if I'm a VC and I want to give a, a grant, I can actually give monthly stipends because now I'm just investing in these real world assets and reinvesting the appreciation of that, of my investment. We can look at token launches, you can look at ICOs, building these into their token models. You can, we have a token sale, but 20% of it's gonna be a hedge into a gold trade tech fund, right? Because we're gonna, we're, this right now is the zero to one, um, getting the value on chain and everything we've been kind of talking about this whole time is to enable what comes next and the, and the private part of it. So I'm from the community from 2017. And you know, a big part of this is not just having rich people say rich. It's having the value enter for the average person to utilize to enhance their life. And that's what they're doing. And this is just the step zero to one. Everything else comes after that. It is true that by, by using tokenization, we, we make various asset classes, including gold and these, much more accessible. To, to, we uh, given this example of real estate earlier, uh, if you can't afford the full building, of course, 
uh, you're not an institutional, you, you can't even afford a, a studio, then you can afford a piece of the real estate and get the yield out of this asset class. Exactly. Uh, we're saying, with the example uh, uh, Nils is, is focusing on the zeal tech and the tokenization of trade, you, you, as a retail investor or not a, or a small investor but accredited um, uh, in today's uh, regulatory terms, um, you, you don't want to chase those SMEs that invoice mate is chasing, uh, but you, you, you want to allocate liquidity to those who are uh, in contact with those SMEs. So we're opening up markets to new, uh, new uh, investors and of course the regulatory uh, boundaries uh, need to be respected. So sometimes we can go to uh, indeed retail, sometimes we can't, uh, but at least the rules are, are quite clear. So it's all about indeed finding the, the use cases where we can um, uh, uh, offer accessibility to various existing or, or new asset classes uh, to, to new uh, investors. But as you say, it's moving from zero to one is doing more things. And I was thinking about the, the tokenization of gold. Uh, could we use a tokenized gold as, as a collateral in, in trade finance transaction? Because collateral management is essential. And prefer, personally, person, if I was a lender, I would prefer tokenized gold than a bill of lading so, of a, a shipment uh, on, on the Pacific uh, Ocean. So, so is that something that we, we could combine gold tokenization with, with trade finance use cases? Yes, uh, why not, I would say. Because uh, what what is the asset class that you are looking for, you know, a trade finance, a stable coin? And uh, apart from USDT, USDC and all these things, what else can give you the stability apart from, you know, gold? So that's the only thing which you should be looking at because it is once you have this USDT, USDC, they will be at a particular level. And I would just give an example. If you have, say, $10,000 worth of uh, USDT six months back, what would be the value today? Can anybody guess? It would be $10,000 only. But if you would have gold, which was trading at 1800 uh, per ounce, and today it's 2500 per ounce. So you can just see what is the appreciation that you're getting in gold then just locking your uh, funds in uh, uh, just a normal stable coin like USDT, USDC or any other stable coin. Yeah. At least you know there is no deep pegging as Nils was saying earlier. Uh, on, the risk is lower I guess on gold than on, on non-regulated stable coins. Uh, uh, Nils, would you see any use case of tokenized gold in your area? Yeah, I think it's uh, we're we're probably coming from a from a same sort of vantage point, but but going at at the at the, at the issue of how do you present um, returns to investors in a different way. Gold is very much a capital appreciation game. Um, you you want to buy the gold, hold it. Typically, um, if you buy physical gold. Um, I think you're, you're about 5% out of pocket once you bought it <laughs> before you can resell it. So that's actually something that makes your product very, um, very attractive. Um, but it's, it's, it's about capital appreciation. But the question is, if I'm an investor who has uh, stable coins, want to stay into stable co in stable coins, but how can I earn real yields? And real yields, I mean yields that are not generated just by some promise where someone goes out and says, oh, give me your stable coins, I pay you 20%. And then you ask him, how do you do that? And well, that's our secret sauce, uh, <laughs> but thank you very much. Um, if you do not want that, then there is not much out there except um, what, we're, what we're offering with, with Yieltech and, and XTC, which is backed by real world assets. So you get exposure to a basket of con invoices that are generated by real businesses. You have full visibility on these invoices. You know who delivered goods to whom, um, what these goods are. These invoices need to be paid within a certain time frame, and you can participate in the commercial return that's generated. If you then also overlay this with the credit insurance, um, which happens in the, in the uh, world of invoice financing quite a lot, there are specialized credit insurers like an Allianz who we work very closely with, then effectively you're generating AA exposure, high, very highly rated exposure, 
at loss rates that you cannot find otherwise. And then again, it's no wonder that the banks have very much kept this to themselves. Um, but now more and more um, investors are coming into this field. You mentioned Goldman Sachs Asset Management, which happened to be a client of ours, but there are other investors um, as well who have uh, launched and trade finance funds. Um, it's something that's opening up. It's a market that, that is ripe for disruption in that sense that more capital is needed. And if you then use a trade finance focused blockchain like XDC to make this happen, to also tap into the stablecoin holder market, then it's, it's really a very, very attractive opportunity. Thank you, Niels. Um, any question? Because actually this is a QA. and a Happy to continue, although we're getting to the, to the end of our uh, time slot. But any question from, from you? Yes, please. So just on the credit insurance, uh, this is this is not being brought in from the SME side or the, the originators of the invoice. This is you are aggregating those and and to have a deal in place from yes. the companies that you mentioned. Yeah. Yes, a very good question. Um, and what we're doing, I think this is something that's very important. We're not buying individual invoices and then repackaging them invoice by invoice, which would be very cumbersome and not very efficient. But what we're doing is we're aggregating portfolios of, of underlying invoices um, and um, making sure that the money that an investor has put in is always put to use. Because if you think about it, and, and uh, I'm gonna answer the question in a second, but there is a bit of explanation needed. Um, if you think about it, invoices have a payment date, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and if they're paid off, they're gone. The invoice doesn't exist anymore. So what you have to do in order to generate the returns for the investor, you have to continuously replenish these invoices. And that's what we're doing um, through uh, financial structuring effectively. And that's also where the credit insurance comes in. This is something indeed that we're putting at our SPV level where we do the aggregation. Uh, that's where the credit insurance is, uh, uh, is put into place for the benefit of the investor. And credit insurance, again, what does it mean? An invoice has a value, say 100, it gets funded at 90, so you pay 90 for the invoice um, of, of 100, the credit insurance would however insure 95 of that insurance, of that invoice. So if the invoice defaults, not only is the 90 that you put out fully covered, but you even have a five, five buffer, because again, the credit insurance that I'm gonna cover up to 95, you only fund at 90, so you're over collateralized. And that's why it's so attractive. If you combine that with the low loss rates that are even without the credit insurance there, then uh, it becomes a, yeah, a, a very, very attractive proposition. Very attractive, very stable in terms of continuous flows, uh, very diversified. Uh, I will use one of the other arguments I forgot to mention earlier. You mentioned and low scalable. cost to entry. And scalable. And, and, scalable. and scalable, yes, as invoice made and others are. Connecting more SMEs and then de-risking, more more indeed SMEs are getting financed and indeed. Um, any other question before we we close, because we have more to share with other speakers. Can I have? Yes, please, yes. you may. I just want to ask that, what's your, I would say, your vision for the next five years about, around RWA, specifically in your domain? Since you come from a finance background, I think you might have a decent understanding of that compared to all of us. So I would just want to know that, because we're in the deep space as well. Yeah, if I, uh, maybe it helps to think five years back to see where we are back to then. When we first started, Andre uh, and, and, and I and, and Mattia, my colleague here, um, we started talking about making trade finance investable. There are a lot of investors that are now in trade finance that we're not really sure what you're talking about. We don't understand this. We're capital markets people, we buy bonds, we buy all sorts of uh, products but we're not buying trade finance. And, and uh, that is 
changing. It hasn't fully changed yet, but it has changed very much over the last five years. And if you think about other asset classes, if you think about mortgages, student loans, credit cards, anything can be bought and anything can be very easily invested. Trade finance is not quite there yet. So I think my vision, expectation, um, firm belief for the next five years is that trade finance will be a mainstream asset class as all these other asset classes. There's always a bit of a push, but uh, if you think back to, to the first ETF that was uh, put out there, people said, we don't really know what this is, a fund that links to uh, the, uh, equities, how does this work, why does it make sense? Well, now the majority of investments of the largest asset managers are in ETFs, and, and, and um, that's something that really shows if, if it makes sense, it will happen. This is something that 100% makes sense, 100% could happen. Thank you, Niels. Good. Well, thank you uh, very much, Yogesh, uh, uh, Niels, and Matthew, for your sharing your insights. First of all, I want to thank you, the speakers. Uh, thank you for joining us. So, the whole day today, we have been discussing about real world assets and discussing about. Uh, new asset classes and uh, how tokenization can bring in new form of asset class and diversification. And the most important thing about that is liquidity. liquidity. Okay. And uh, within the liquidity, uh, we've got amazing panel over here who can actually discuss more about it, that where the liquidity is coming from, how can we be able to basically uh, have this continuation of this liquidity. So yeah, uh, firstly, let me introduce, uh, you can just discuss Hello everyone, uh, I'm Arturo Cantera, CEO and founder of Pre Numbers Labs. Uh, about Pre Numbers, uh, we have an uh, NFT marketplace built here on the, on the network. We have a uh, lending and borrowing protocol and liquid staking. And in the lending and borrowing protocol, we will support uh, real world assets. So that's why we are here today talking about a lot of real world assets and let's discuss more in the panel. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Mana Rifki. Uh, I'm a VC investor uh, we, uh, from Chromi Ventures. We just got uh, the first uh, uh, license from ADGM uh, for, uh, for, for a VC uh, investing in uh, all Web3, means token and equity. Um, I'm also doing some research on the academic side and I'm advising some of the RWA projects uh, in Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, thank you for sticking around and uh, looking forward to learn from my uh, fellow panelists. Thank you. Hey everyone, so Tyler Carter, uh, co-founder of Fathom, um, but maybe I should say DAO representative as it's fully decentralized. Um, so we are an RWA DeFi protocol. Um, the message is basically DeFi is a distribution channel for tokenized securities, tokenized RWA. Uh, we have a CDP stable coin uh, that is backed by RWA. We have a stable swap DEX. Um, we have a vault product that basically allows people to uh, instantly mint um, a tokenized version, like a, a tokenized ETF based on whatever basket they choose. So decentralized create redeem process for ETFs and um, we have RWA borrowing and lending as well. Uh, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, providing us this kind of infrastructures. I mean, you guys are building up something very interesting for the future as we were discussing earlier about it, the infrastructure of it and like the discussion was coming up that in five years of time, this is actually inevitable that this industry is going to engage in real world assets. So I do want to start with you. Uh, uh, how do you think that uh, liquidity, because in the real world class as well with invoices that we've discussed with trade finance and all, they're bringing in these kind of liquidation. How prime numbers can be able to provide that uh, stability and uh, you know a confidence to the investors? Thank you. So about prime finance, that is the the protocol that we are building that will bring this real world asset liquidity. Uh, let's think about uh, Abe and all the TBL that they have around 18 billion right now. Uh, talking about all Web3. Uh, about real world assets is so much bigger. Uh, all of these uh, real world assets are going to be tokenized, so they will go to the, let's say, traditional crypto, because it's not traditional, because it's really new, all of this. 
So, uh, you are able to put as a collateral uh, these real world assets. Uh, there is going to be like different pools with uh, USDT or stable coins in this case, and you are going to be able to, to borrow uh, with your with the collateral. So, uh, with this uh, borrow, you are going to be able to use uh, whatever you want to increase your, um, let's say, EPI in different uh, staking protocols, and then you just need to, to pay back uh, the, the loan. So, yeah, put these real world assets as a collateral in a lending and borrowing protocol similar to, to Aave. Uh, Prime Numbers is also involved in NFTs as well. Uh, so this is another aspect of liquidity that you can, but there are risks assigned to it, uh, especially with terms of bringing more investors into the Aave. How does Prime Numbers combat that challenge? So uh, we also have uh, Prime Port, that is NFT marketplace. So some of the real world assets are NFTs. Uh, they tokenize, let's say, um, uh, real estate. Uh, so you are able to sell on trade uh, this NFT also on the on the NFT marketplace, and about to get uh, new users. I think this opens uh, the door to the also retail investors. Uh, let's say in the case of um, real estate, uh, they are going to be able to invest uh, to do uh, the. Um, Fractionalize. Uh, you're going to fractionalize real world assets, so you're able to trade everything in, in an NFT marketplace, or let's say also talking about lending and borrowing, you can put there a fractionalized uh, real world assets, for example. So I think the opportunities are really, really big in, in this ecosystem when you have a clear infrastructure about how to use everything. Thank you. Uh, you are actually working at CBDC. And uh, so with that, uh, you know, within liquidity, one of the ways to come up is fractional ownership. And the new form is also coming, up, which is getting popular is now staking. Uh, how these kind of things, uh, CBDC can engage interaction with the investors and provide uh, some kind of sustainability into it. Sure. I mean, uh, I don't believe that uh, CBC is uh, the way, you know, to go and uh, have a certain, uh, you know, exposure for either retail investors or uh, uh, institutional investors. Uh, I think we are seeing a lot of bank deposit, uh, tokenized bank deposit, that's the way to go. Uh, Circle as well, uh, they are doing great work uh, with multiple institutions. So, uh, and uh, last but not least, I'm very close, or like I, uh, I live in Singapore and Hong Kong, and I guess the government of Hong Kong is doing a lot of uh, uh, regulations around digital assets. So uh, we are seeing with the HSBC the tokenization of gold, but also uh, something called uh, short uh, uh, deposit uh, treasury bills. So the tokenization of treasury bills and making it as a collateral. Um, CBDC is coming for retail and uh, uh, wholesale uh, uh, central bank on, on a central bank level, but for uh, the RWA, I don't see that's the way to go. I guess we have a lot of uh, products within the market now uh, for the projects that I have mentioned and the entities that I have mentioned, that they are way, uh, way more suitable for this kind of uh, asset tokenization. And again, the problem that we have is the interoperability between these networks, right? Uh, as much as I'm, like you know, advocating for the real world, world asset tokenization, however, we have to keep in mind that we are still in early stage. Uh, uh, the first step to go forward is the regulation. So as long as we don't have clear reg regulation, we can't do much. Uh, we have uh, mentioned uh, a lot during this conference about uh, real estate tokenization. I don't know, for me, I see it like, you know, with the existing uh, uh, inf uh, infrastructure, financial infrastructure that we have through a REITs and tokenizing a REITs, that's more than enough for like, you know, the average or the most sophisticated investor. I think, you know, by adding more technology, sometimes we are adding a layer of complexity, especially for the projects that they have on operational side. So I guess, you know, this kind of uh, education for uh, the investors and also the technologies, it's very important because not everything can be, you know, RWA. If we can work with the existing frameworks and again, you know, putting in mind uh, to have a clear uh, regulation uh, 
a framework that's the most important rather than just jumping into how we can you know add the DeFi or add the you know a decentralized element. Don't get me wrong, I love anything, you know, DGEN, decentralized and everything. However, for these kind of projects that they have uh, more, you know, where we are bringing more uh, a layer of, uh, of risk rather than uh, facilitating, you know, investment. So uh, this is why it's very important to keep in mind what is the goal. It is to attract more investment. The, you know, the, the regulated uh, investors, they are not willing to put more risk in in in, uh, in uh, an existing uh, risk uh, framework i mean uh, investment uh, risky investment right. so uh, this is why uh, you know we have to uh, have a clear framework whether either we want to you know tokenize an asset with the existing tools that we have with the through an spv for example or uh, any you know traditional way uh, rather than making more complex you know the investment uh, for the DAOs and the DeFi, uh, if we see the like you know the active numbers of of DeFi users, it's just hundred thousand you know users uh, across you know many uh, active uh, active uh, platforms. So uh, uh, I don't see if uh, you know where the most institutionalized investors are ready to go through that risk. And you know there are a lot of uh, hacking happening, uh, the lack of regulation. Uh, this is why we have to keep in mind uh, to uh, uh, converge between the existing uh, financial uh, uh, financial frameworks that you have already, and I think yeah, maybe USDC Circle they are doing great great work with the government and regulation. Uh, so uh, responding to your question, CBDC is not like you know the way to go. Either you know maybe tokenized uh, bank uh, uh, deposit, uh, tokenized bank deposit, or. Uh, Circle, you know, as USDC, but not Tether, for example, you know. So yeah. 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 I'll just build you. You said one thing that stuck out to me, and that's just um, how early we are, and I don't think people really realize this. But uh, crypto to date's really just been like an experiment. You know, we've hit a couple trillion in market cap. But I've seen more now. Um, before I started Batham and Decent Labs, I was head of digital assets as a currency. It was a top three tokenization shop. We did the first tokenized securities uh, through the SEC. Um, but we're also doing DeFi stuff. So we rebuilt the securities lending business line uh, using a no-code tool uh, for a State Street bank. And we had guys up and running and deploying you know, DeFi protocols for SIC lending in two days. And their estimated cost savings just for this one business line was a billion dollars a year. That's the type of thing that's about to happen to finance. Uh, so just wanted to give it some scale, despite the challenges, but yeah. I mean, just to add on that, like earlier we would be discussing about bringing in a real value uh, on chain networks. And through these kind of, like you talked about, these saving of these uh, costs for new business lines, how do you feel that new value can be provided, uh, real time value can be provided on chain networks, uh, given that we are just the beginning in this industry? and only few asset classes that we can right now engage because of the regulatory aspects. Mm -hmm. So in your experience, how do you think we can explore more industries? Um, yeah, yeah, so uh, you bring up something good and this has actually been a big issue for tokenized securities to date. Um, a couple big firms have tokenized a decent size of inventory, but it just sits on their books. There's no way to use it. There's no volume, there's no users. And maybe this is too much insider information. I won't share the firm name, but um, there's an abstraction layer coming for tokenized securities, so anyone will be able to use them within DeFi, and that's coming like now. And this is why you see Biddle get set up, this is why you see Scope get set up on Securitize. Um, that money is starting to move in, and they you know, plopped 100 million down first, first time off. This is not a bad start. Um. Talking about what you've been just discussing, uh, how Prime Lab is basically, uh, you know, involving arts, culture, and uh, this kind of sectors into uh, DeFi and bring liquidity, especially towards. We were just talking about the entrepreneurs and businesses, but I think artists would also be needing capital, and how can Prime Labs can provide liquidity to them? So just to ask something to to you first. <laughs> I think in, uh, all the liquidity is coming, 100% uh, you see with this lot, uh, 100 million that comes in. But I think uh, we need to make like 
blockchain safer. I mean, talking about the hacks in DeFi protocols, uh, exploits, uh, scams, everything. We need to make uh, the not the popular opinion, but also the the business opinion uh, so much clean. Because right now, if you talk about crypto and blockchain, meme coins, uh, a lot of things that are not attractive for the I want to say real investors or big investors. And now to your to your question, sorry, um, about art, uh, luxury, uh, real world assets, um, all of this. Um, there is some technologies uh, already uh, with NMCs uh, that you are able to get a real world asset, I mean um, a luxury asset, and then convert it to an to an NFT, and then you are able to trade uh, this this NFT in, in an NFT marketplace. Uh, I think also adding this uh, collateral, for for example, uh, judge. Uh, I think uh, the very beginning of all of this uh, tokenization in art or luxury items uh, uh, will start um, with these uh, big firms. Uh, let's say uh, big brands. Uh, like I don't want to say anything about Louis Vuitton, uh, Ferrari. Uh, these big partners that need to do the first movement. Uh, to be able to have all of these uh, real world assets in blockchain. Uh, coming back to this role of CBDC uh, in your capacity, you just shared that it's now coming up ADGM as well. How do you see uh, securitized models coming in UAE and how much uh, liquidity is provided and available over here? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, I mean, given our experience by uh, uh, challenging, you know, the regulators, but I guess the UE is such a, a beautiful country to be in, and is uh, like given the. I mean, if I uh, have to uh, compare between the discussions that we had one year ago and us having the first licensed VC to invest in everything, I guess they are very uh, willing. They are willing to. Uh, uh, to be uh, creative and to uh, listen to the industry experts. So uh, we were very fortunate to have uh, direct, uh, you know, contacts with the uh, FSRA, uh, having a lot of round tables, and uh, in within like six to eight months, yeah, it's a bit long for to seek for a VC license. However, we really appreciate how they have been uh, uh, willing to change the law and they did. So uh, this is just you know from uh, the GC uh, perspective. Uh, for sec securitization, I think uh, uh, we uh, already have many uh, projects coming and uh, being licensed by Vara. Uh, I haven't seen many, I mean, excuse me, I'm uh, just not aware about a lot in EGM. However, uh, Within the UAE, I guess uh, VARA is doing great work by uh, regulating some of uh, the LWA projects within the infrastructure or uh, the fractionalization of ownership. Uh, for the liquidity, um, again, you know, we are talking about a very sophisticated, uh, sophisticated uh, investors. A uh, lot of education should uh, still be in place to educate the existing investors because in the end of the day we, we don't want only the crypto or the blockchain savvy investors. We want the traditional investors to come in because one problem with RWA is also the secondary market. Yes, you know, putting your assets on an exchange, you know, on a regulated uh, RWA exchange is great, but uh, how about the next level, you know, to, to uh, 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 finish the cycle? So I guess uh, it's very important to uh, get uh, more traditional investors within the ecosystems because they are the secondary market. That's what creates the real liquidity. Uh, otherwise, we will be just stuck with uh, you know uh, assets that they are tokenized, but there is no uh, uh, demand uh, on the other side. Uh, I think uh, not only in the UAE but worldwide, uh, maybe in jurisdictions like Switzerland or Luxembourg, uh, we have seen a lot of securitization, like you know, for many years. This is why, for me, you know, uh, going through the traditional way of an SPV and tokenized fund is way uh, easier for the traditional investor to understand it and maybe adding of course you know the layer of technology that makes things easy but uh, I guess it's a problem worldwide but uh, uh, given the fact that BlackRock, JP Morgan are uh, leading the way it's a very 
good uh, green signal for uh, the future of tokenization. I just wanted to ask with the fact, um, uh, like we have just been discussing about the lack of market debt uh, because of the understanding, the awareness, and the technical barriers also, like we discussed about the blockchain infrastructure getting penetrated by hackers. How Phantom is basically providing this uh, solution, like bringing, overcoming these challenges and be able to provide liquidity for lenders and borrowers? Thanks. Yeah, to um, one thing that you were saying too, uh, no one has built a market that connects the buy side to the sell side yet in crypto, especially for tokenized securities, I mean specifically. Um, and this is the biggest hurdle. That's why we were building, you know, DeFi out as a distribution channel when I was at Securency, and that's you know what we do with Fathom now. Um, but to your question on security, um, I, I look at security as like a three-stage process, and in crypto, the third stage isn't really an option. So you have, you can do audits before you launch a protocol, and then stage two is once your protocol is live. Stage three is after a hack. So. Pretty much you only have people focused on stage one now. So we've done multiple stage one audits. Yes, you do need this as well. But the newest thing sort of coming out and we're linked up with a few is someone that live monitors the protocol as it's running and can take action to, to shut down exploiters. And literally, I, you know, I wouldn't even use a protocol that's not you know, at least pivoting that way. I think it becomes ubiquitous uh, very, very quickly. Yeah, I mean, market depth gets solved pretty easy once security gets solved and once RWAs are tokenized and moving freely around DeFi. So I, I think DeFi, the ability to use tokenized securities in DeFi is really sort of the start of this flywheel and we haven't seen it start yet. So uh, that'll start happening, you know, pretty much now for the next several decades. <laughs> Well, um, if, uh, thank you everybody for your contribution and sharing us with your insights. Anybody in here does have any questions to raise to the panel? Yes. Hi, it's Kelvin. Uh, I run the Food Sand Exchange. I'm just curious about uh, the DeFi protocol. Do you mm. KYC the underlying assets then? There's no KYC on that. I, I need the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Question? <laughs> nah. <laughs> um, we're fully permissionless, and look, I've been dragged into a lot of lawyers' offices over the past few years by other people, not myself, uh, to discuss this. Um, in the end, we spun out of Securency to really remain permissionless, and this was a massive gamble for us, but the new solutions about the abstraction layer that I was mentioning earlier means that this was the right gamble. And now when you go talk to a tokenized securities provider, the person who does all the actual tokenization, they only want to work with permissionless protocols. A bit cool, there are some neat new protocols that instantly KYC'd and gate capped, but that's not an innovative product. That is the same finance that's been happening for hundreds of years just on a website. Um, so I'm very pro permissionless, but yes, you need an abstraction layer to someone who's doing you know, KYC, AML, but uh, it's too much of a barrier to make users do it for DeFi use actively. Sufficient? <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Um, to my uh, you mentioned the educational programs for um, the regular investors, so do you know if the government is planning any initiatives um, are there initiatives to scale this knowledge here? Uh, yeah, great question. I guess uh, there are a lot of round tables uh, with the industry experts. That's what I have seen, you know, but uh, it's a great uh, point, you know. I think we need more education programs, like more structured. Uh, I guess, I guess uh, with the people, great minds that you have in the room, I'm sure, you know, we can think, you know, uh, about something in this, in those lines, they yeah, are great fonts. But uh, what I have seen so far is mainly round tables with industry experts to share, you know, knowledge, but nothing really a structure, not a structure, uh, education programs, for example, for the investors. Yes, anybody else? All right, uh, well, uh, yes. Good afternoon. Uh, one time for real estate, uh, we contract for energy, we 
that. Can you explain uh, a bit more? So we are also a decentralized platform. Uh, basically, we will provide these through parlets. Uh, let's say uh, context gold, hub gold, tokenized gold, uh, real world asset. Uh, we are going to support all of these tokenized assets because at the end, in the backend, they are uh, ERC721 or ERC20. So for us, it's really easy to support them. I mean, we as a company, we are not going to do the tokenization of the asset. We will support uh, tokenized assets that are tokenized from different business or partners. Yes, uh, well, uh, for again, thank you all for your participation and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you everybody for coming and joining and contributing. Thank you so much. Thank you.